Welcome to the Valhalla Filmcast, a show where normal guys talk about the films that they love. And here are your hosts, Bryce Thompson, Brian Hammond, and Cody Ryrie. Now get ready, because the show starts in 3, 2, 1. No, refusing to watch E.T., period. Sad, period. It's so insulting. Just the sad with the period is so insulting. <laughs> <laughs> like, whoa, whoa, pal. I think, whoa. I think you deserve it on E.T. Like, a Spielberg movie, No, it's it's like canon, you know? You have to watch it. It's a rite of Many passage. Many people I, consider E.T. Nope. the ultimate Spielberg movie. Like, that's the one, you know? Well, so. <laughs> I will never see the ultimate Spielberg movie. I, I don't care if... It's uh, I speak well, to right. how you, less I care. You watched Munich, and that's important, and I'm okay with that. See, but. I invite any of our listeners to go out and to do something that they don't want to do ever, and then I'll watch ET. That's a fascinating <laughs> challenge. Huh. You name something that you absolutely despise hate and i'll watch et i'm going to i'm going to put this on the table right now that i don't hate anything as much as you hate et it sounds like because <laughs> i i can't come up with anything like i would try I'll anything i'll never watch it like once i'll literally you know never I mean? watch it has your wife seen it bryce i think so yeah. but again i don't really care because i don't like et so wow there's there's no crack it, it, in the shell yeah like, okay we'll agree to disagree Let's talk about something less depressing. All right. Well, welcome to the Valhalla Filmcast. I'm Bryce Thompson. Yeah, he is. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at him. And we hope you enjoyed our, our show last week with our new format. Uh, we're going to keep that going. Again, we had a vague uh, announcement to a podcast that is going to be coming out with the three of our voices at the helm. Uh, Ooh, I like that. At the do helm. We want, yeah. Do we want to release the name of this No, this no, 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 no. I don't know. Mm. Nah, let's lead them on. Okay. <laughs> I that, way they're, I that way they're really disappointed when they hear it. So they have a time to... <laughs> <laughs> uh... A date? Should we give him a date? We got to give him something. Uh, mm. Look for this show on May first. Is when this new podcast's first show will be coming out. Oh boy, it's out there. It's official. That's pretty now quick. We, I know we, we can't right. procrastinate just done anymore. It. What the heck, Bryce? Now we've just done it. We've mm. done it. Uh, look for this new new uh, podcast. Um, we're super excited for it. Uh, we hope that it fulfills all of your film needs and desires. Know. That was lame. <laughs> oh, and for those listeners who are really involved, vote for the one host you want voted off the podcast for the new show. So, because we're going to cut it down to two, it's going to be. I'm just kidding. We're not doing that. No, we're no the one Hall is a cut- survivor. That was a joke <laughs> because like. I've totally been vying for it on Facebook. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Secretly, Cody is getting voted off the, the show. A, I know. I don't want to do that. I'd be head first on the chopping block. That's a bad idea. So, no, it'll still be the three of us. And anybody else but, who wants to come on and is eloquent and as articulate as we are, so it's a low bar, can also come on in the future. So Yes, definitely. Please uh, share this information with your family and friends. Um, expect to be if you do like us on Facebook which all of anyone who's listening to this should have liked us on Facebook um, prepare to be bombarded with announcements Um, and there's going to be some sad announcements coming up but don't worry we hope that the happy ones will suffice but moving on to uh, some news in the film world uh there's been a new trailer 
that has dropped a big one, uh, Star Wars, The Last Jedi. Uh, what did you think of that, Cody? Uh, of the new trailer. Well, I'm going to – we're all friends here, so I can reveal <laughs> the depth of my nerdiness. I was watching yes. Star Wars Celebration on a live stream. Uh, before the <laughs> trailer came out, I just caught the end of it, and then of course I went back and watched the entire panel, as well as the 40th anniversary panel, the Hamill himself panel, and the tribute to Carrie Fisher. Cody, but, you do realize yeah. this is going out worldwide, right? Like, <laughs> you really want people to know you're that big of a Star Wars. Fan. <laughs> so the thing that's so interesting about the trailer is um, it, of course, has a much more of a darker tone. Than Force Awakens did. Yeah. Force Awakens was basically, yay, Han Solo's back and everybody's happy. And that's all they had to do to sell yeah, it. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> you know. But in this new one, they've got to kind of take characters in different ways. And, of course, the big reveal the or the big question mark is at the end of the trailer, Luke Skywalker saying that the Jedi must end. And so we don't know yeah. what that means. The movie is called The Last Jedi. And for some further clarification, since Jedi can be singular or plural. You can have one Jedi or a group of Jedi. It is not. There's no S. But in foreign languages, the uh, title has been translated to plural Jedi. So for those of us who get way too into this kind of thing, that leads us to believe that it's the end of the Jedi Order as we know it. Which, you know, who knows where they've taken this. Could be very interesting things. We'll have to wait and see for December. And if this was a Star Wars podcast, I'd just given us three hours worth of discussion. But it's not a Star Wars podcast, so we're not going to go that <laughs> no, deep. No, it into. is. It is. It is not actually. So, do you uh, have any theories, Cody? I mean, you mentioned <laughs> theories. It's just a teaser trailer, right? Yeah. And so there isn't yeah. a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of substance there. But let's go ahead and get room two thirty seven on this because <laughs> it sounds like it sounds like okay. you, you want All to right. invent can... some things from thin air. So let's go ahead, go Cody. I can do this in about two minutes, and then we can get back on to- on topic here. Um, <laughs> Brian, did you watch the teaser trailer? I did. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because if not, I was going to say you can turn your computer off now. You're done. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> here's the thing. I think because you look at the beginning of the trailer, Luke Skywalker has. You know, Ray doing her force thing, and she sees light, darkness, and the balance. And then he says it's time for the Jedi to end. So, a lot of other pundits, as it were, have come up with this idea, and I think it sounds interesting that not that there is no more force using, but that uh, the Jedi are an antiquated and dogmatic organization that advocated for the killing of, you know, Darth Vader in the original movies, and Luke kind of trumped them on that. And if you count the prequels, they're the ones that kind of let the, the Republic fall. And so there's problems with dividing the world into light and dark, into good and bad. And that to be truly enlightened, you have to mix elements of both. And there are theories that Luke has learned in his isolation and through his painful experiences that to be a true master of the Force means to incorporate light and dark and not just the narrow, dogmatic view of the Jedi. Hmm. So yeah, there you go. That's... That's the layman's version. I was uh, no references to the Clone Wars cartoons or Rebels or any novelizations that would go into this. So, yeah, there you go. That's the. We'll see what and happens. We all thank you. We all thank you for that. <laughs> so they just want to make everyone like the same. Not the same, no, but more balanced. Now that could be totally hogwash. That could be totally not true in any way. It could be just, it is just purely speculation at this point. But that's, that's the prevailing theory that I've heard. I'm not saying I subscribe to it or even want it to happen, but that's the prevailing theory. Fair enough. Next. Cool. <laughs> uh, also in news, uh, Donnie Darko. Yes. Brian, this is your wheelhouse. Yes. Yesterday, I just received a substantially damaged. By the way, from in the words of Mike Berbiglia, glamazon.com. And um, it's kind of munched up, so I'm going to have to get a new copy because, you know, I'm a OCD about stuff like that. But it, it did launch Tuesday, and uh, it came out Tuesday, and it looks really awesome. Obviously, I haven't opened it yet, but it's brand new 4K restorations of both the theatrical, cu- theatrical cut and director's cut. Plus a whole other um, disc of special features and a booklet 
to go along with that. So I'm totally stoked about yeah. this and really That's one movie we should dissect at some point in the future because if there is yeah. a movie on this planet that lends itself to long discussion and argument, it is Donnie Darko. Yes. Yes. Speaking of Donnie Darko, this I I have failed the world as for not seeing that movie. I have not seen well, it. Well that's yet. a good Now's reason to revisit Now's your chance. it for us. Yeah. yeah. I agree. I I've I mean, it's everywhere. I'm surprised the movie hasn't been ruined. I mean it could have been ruined and I wouldn't even know. But... It's a hard movie to ruin. Because see, it's I don't. We should, we should watch it. And when my friends and I watched it on a, a vacation right after high school, it was one of the first DVDs we ever watched. And nice. it was the only movie as a group that we ever watched. And then it stopped. It ended. We all looked at each other, and then like almost wordlessly, not entirely, went back and just started it again because we didn't <laughs> nice. know what we'd seen and we couldn't <laughs> figure it out. But we were yeah. so intrigued, we wanted to watch it. <laughs> Again. Was it too long ago to remember if it was theatrical directors? Do you know, Cody? It was too long ago. I don't remember because I think they released them both on DVD. <clears throat> because I'm gonna, I'm gonna put out a little information. I'm slightly embarrassed about. I've only seen the director's cut, and I'm really embarrassed about that because I've heard um, some discussion that it's actually uh, worse than the theatrical cut. And so I'm, I'm I've really gonna dissect. Yeah. I'm really gonna dissect that with this. Uh, Edition, so I'm kind of excited. I went as Donnie Darko one year for Halloween. Um, wow. It's just, uh, <laughs> yeah, I love and it. So I'm get this, uh, Bryce. It's your buddy Jake Gyllenhaal. I know. I was going to mention that Jake. He should have won a billion Oscars by now. Yes, he should have. I yes, agree. he is the next Leo. He's the next Leo. And sad news for Jake. I could see it not ever happening. But that's another discussion for another time. <laughs> uh, Shape of Water. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, Shape of Water, Dier- yeah. Guillermo del Toro's new film. Uh, right now, at least as of this recording, Guillermo del Toro is in Paris uh, working with the composer Alexandra Desplat. I think I said that right. On uh, sure. writing the music for the film, <laughs> which means that there's a cut that's done enough that they can do that, which is exciting. But we just got an official uh, announcement of the release date. Uh, the, what I heard was December 8th. Now, the only thing that makes me a little worried about that is it's by Fox Searchlight. And Fox Searchlight loves to do New York and Los Angeles only releases, which yeah. helps me not at all, Fox Searchlight. Not at all. <laughs> So we'll see. That's also a good date because it means uh, per potential Oscar buzz. That's Oscar season, December. Mm. And limited releases in December, that means they have some, some faith in the project. Uh, Doug Jones, his frequent collaborator who played uh, the Pale Man and the Fawn in Pan's Labyrinth, he plays a character in the film, and he talked about how much he related to the story, thought it was great. We don't know much about it, except it takes place in the 60s in some kind of Cold War laboratory where Doug Jones plays a fish man that falls in love with a female janitor. That's all I know. Is hmm. Do we know? So we don't know if Ron Perlman's in it at all? I don't think he is, but uh, Michael Shannon is, which I thought was interesting. Ooh, interesting. I like what him. Was the, uh, yeah. What's the cartoon that he just recently did? Ron Perlman? No. Del oh, Del Toro. Del Toro uh, Troll Hunters. Troll Hunters was yes, the... Yes, Troll Hunters. That's yeah, what it was. I've, I've yeah, watched okay. that. Um, my wife has watched it twice with our little girl. Uh, it's wonderful. It's, it is the yeah. only Del Toro you can watch if uh, you have very high standards for content. And what she... Because <laughs> <laughs> it is very much a children's it. show, but it's also very much Del Toro. He didn't lose any of himself when he made it. That's as cool. far as I know, it is the number one watched children's show on netflix now and they've been officially greenlit for a second season which they just started working on and that is a netflix yeah, original awesome. right they it is yes. it. Yeah. yeah cool all right uh moving on any other news that we want to bring up before we move on uh movies we watched uh i didn't really watch much this week so you guys can take over there. <laughs> well, I wanted to throw this out. I, I did put a little thing on f- in, on Facebook when I saw this movie in the theaters, but I never spoke about it on the podcast, even though I said I would. Uh, Split, the new M. Night Shyamalan film, just hit Blu-ray. 
it is, in my humble opinion, uh, a return to form for him. It's the best thing he's done since he was making Unbreakable and Signs and The Sixth Sense. It's For me, it's that good. The first time I saw it, I thought it was really good. The second time I saw it in the theaters, which I don't go to movies twice much anymore, it was even better. And then I watched it at home, and I liked it even more. There's just so much to really like. It's my favorite movie so far this year of the ones I've seen. Talk about just the the cinematography by the the man who shot It Follows. Also another great looking movie. Uh, uses of darks and of course James McAvoy hitting it out of the county, not out of the park. Just an incredible performance where I think he plays he's supposed to play 26 personalities or something like that. You only see like 9 on screen. But sometimes you see those personalities in the same scene and he has to switch back and forth and it's jaw dropping. It's amazing. It's worth watching just for his performance, but also a great score, just great to look at. Everybody else in the movie is great. Anya Taylor Joy from The Witch as the main girl who gets kidnapped. She's fantastic. I I've wanted M. Knight to come back for a long time. He's one of my favorites yeah. from back in the day when he's making stuff, and then things really collapsed. And to be honest, if he had not cast this movie correctly with James McAvoy, it could have been the crown poo of all the poos. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's one of those movies I was watching it and I was like, man, this could have been terrible. This could have been so bad. And yet it's not, it's really, really good. And also there are implications in it. The twist ending is the most exciting twist ending that he's ever had for me. Um, it's kind of a cl- uh, a clicky twist ending, but it's amazing. And I'm so excited. And I've been checking, I've been stalking him on Twitter now just to see how fast he gets his next movie done. He's been talking about writing it. So I haven't been this excited about M. Night since 2004. And so it's just great. It, it's great to have him back. It's been a, a good year. We got we got Mel Gibson back, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And yep. Uh, M. Night Shyamalan. Like, yeah. Awesome. Who directed the Get, Get Out movie? That was uh, uh, Peel. Jordan Peel. Um, Okay. Yeah. For some reason, I thought that was M. Night Shyamalan. For some reason, I don't know why. Well, they were released very close together, and by they were both released by the same company, uh, Bloomhouse, oh, Jason okay. Bloom's company. Okay. So, it, I can't believe that Split was a $9 million movie, and it's made something like $270 million worldwide. Wow. Holy cow. So, everybody got rich off that one. It did yeah. really well. Oh, yeah. That's good. He deserves that. He needs it. He needs it. Um, cool. I watched uh, Let's Kill Ward's Wife. Uh, this is a little film from 2014. And uh, don't ask me why I pulled it, because the meta score is, is 21 on IMDb. And, <laughs> and 5.4 5. Wow. 5. 5. user rating out of uh, mm. almost 5,000 people. I am in the minority. I really enjoyed it. And I don't know why for sure. In fact, this is the first time I pulled it up on IMDb, like right now, and I'm kind of floored that it's that low. Um, it's a, a feature film debut uh, from writer and director Scott Foley, which you may know from uh, episodes of Scrubs, uh, True Blood. Um, you'd probably have to look up his picture to even recognize him, and you probably may not even recognize him. But um, also the um, Donald Faison. Uh, from Scrubs, I don't remember the character he played in that, but uh, African American, uh, he's in this. Um, he's Ward, um, and then also, um, oh, his mind just escaped me. He's in Insidious. What's his name? Help me out, Cody. Uh, Ethan Hawke. Patrick Wilson. <laughs> Patrick Wilson. Oh, I was thinking <laughs> yes. of Sinister. I was thinking of Sinister. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So, anyways. Um, there are a couple standout performance in, in for performances in this. Uh, Amy Acker plays uh, Ward's wife, and she is the most despicable human being. And she does Amy such, Acker, yeah, and she does such a great job. Like it, she really did it good. And I know, like, wives and and moms like this. Like <laughs> that's how good she plays it. Not well, not personally. For all my friends out oh, there, I'm not oh, talking oh. about you. But I'm just saying, <laughs> like, I know these people exist, and she just nails it. She does such a good job. And then the that's, other stand out performance. Isn't it surprising, just real quick, because I watched <laughs> all the seasons of Angel, and she was a main character on Angel, and she was, like, the cutest, sweetest, kind of nerdiest girl on that show. 
throughout the almost its entire run. So to hear that she can play mean and vicious, that's interesting. She's got some range I didn't see coming. Yeah. So yeah. Um, and then the other standout uh, performance is Joe Hardesty, which I've never seen in anything before. I think that's his name. It, it's, um, anyways, it's a very dark comedy. Uh, very dark. Um, in fact, uh, most people probably wouldn't even laugh. But I found strange uh, dark humor in it, and it made me <laughs> chuckle. But I just was engrossed in the in the, you know. Everyone hates her, all the friends, all the wives of the friends hate her, and they accidentally kind of uh, kill her, one guy, and everyone kind of joins together to, uh, you know, take care of this uh, mess they've created for themselves, including Ward eventually, and that's no spoiler. Um, so it, I found it funny, and uh, I guess I'm in the minority, and I hopefully we don't lose some viewers that have seen this and go, <laughs> what the heck, because... <laughs> I really enjoyed it, so take it for what it's oh, worth. Oh, I just remembered another movie I watched this week. Sorry. Can I interject real quick? I totally Absolutely, forgot. Absolutely, I'm done. Okay. This is a movie called The Visit, and it's not the M. Night Shyamalan one. It's one from the 60s. Uh, it has Anthony Quinn in it, and, uh, oh gosh, because I forgot I watched this. I forgot to look up the, the names. The Bergman uh, from Casablanca. Uh, what's her oh, name? Oh, uh, Ingrid. Ingrid, that's right. Ingrid Bergman from Casablanca. It was a, a film made in the 60s, right when they were pushing up against censorship. And you could tell they were like, yay, freedom. And uh, they made it in Italy. And it's the story of a woman, played by Ingrid Bergman, who comes from some unnamed European town. And when she's young, she uh, is beaten by the school teacher. And Tony Quinn's character, uh, we're friends, Tony. Uh, Anthony Quinn's character uh, is her boyfriend, and he gets her pregnant. But because he wants to live a nicer life and marry a rich girl, he says that she's promiscuous, and he bribes people in the town to say she's promiscuous, and she gets run out even when she's, like, super pregnant, and she has to go live in a whorehouse. And her life gets ruined by this guy in this town, the whole town. And then some millionaire, billionaire, marries her out of the whorehouse and dies, and she owns like a quarter of the world. And she comes back with all of her money to destroy the people who hurt her and the town. <laughs> and uh, she does it in very unique ways by offering, you know, money and bribes. And it's kind of a, I don't know, a moralistic, more a very moral driven kind of horror social comedy. There is some. Very dark comedy in the film. I want. I don't want to give more away than that because it is one of those movies. It's really fun to watch it unveil. I looked it up. It does. It has one DVD release, no Blu-ray, and the DVD release is uh, cropped. It's pan and scan, so you can't oh, even yeah. get this movie in its original aspect ratio. I watched it at my mom's house from for her birthday. That's kind of. It's kind of family we have, and uh, that's the that's movie awesome. she picked for us all to watch on her birthday. <laughs> As were, I don't know if that was a secret mess. I should have thought about that. Anyway, um, <laughs> but it was a really, really well-acted movie. Brought up a lot of questions, and whoever made it and wrote it had very little faith in humanity and the human condition, but in an entertaining way. So there you go, The Visit with Ingrid Bergman and Anthony Quinn. It, it comes on the Fox Movie Channel apparently quite a bit. I do recommend it just so you can have somebody to talk to about it because now after I talk to about it with my parents, I'm alone in the world. So, fascinating movie, very obscure film, quick shout out. I'm done. Cool. Great, wonderful. Uh, the one movie that I really watched was The Quiz Show, which yeah. we are going to talk about today. Uh, Cody, you want to go ahead and explain what The Quiz Show is all about? Yeah, absolutely. It's depending on where you look. A 1994 or 1995 movie. Uh, I'm pretty sure it came out in 94, but it was up in the 95 Oscars. It is uh, based on a true story. It takes place in the 50s when uh, a quiz show called 21 was the biggest show on television. I think there was three channels back then, though, so it wasn't a giant thing. And come to find out, uh, people have to come on and they have to know a lot of trivia about history and math and science and whatever else. The whole thing was rigged. Everything was staged. Everybody had the answers beforehand. And it was this giant scandal when it was found out. And people got prosecuted for perjury and obstruction Mm -hmm. of justice for not coming forward, for 
being on a, f- a fake television show in the 50s. And the film kind of follows the investigation. It also follows the the main contestant, um, Charles Van Doren, who is played by Ray Fiennes. Uh, also in the film is John Turturro, uh, Rob Morrow, who people who watch Northern Exposure will know because he was the main yes. character in that. One of my uh, favorites. Pa- there you go. Paul Schofield is in it as well, and we'll talk about him. He's my favorite actor in the film. Mira Sorvino gives an early turn, and Martin Scorsese shows up as yep. an actor and plays himself, basically. I mean, he's not really playing himself. <laughs> he is but... always solid. Like, in his movies that he does cameos, he does a good job. Yeah, I yeah. Think. he plays kind of a slimy uh, yeah. runner of an aluminum company, and he does pretty mm-hmm. good, but he's just Martin Scorsese, though. There's nothing that different yeah. about him. Right. That's probably why. Character actor. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, it was directed by uh, Robert Redford. It got four Oscar nominations the year it came out. Best Picture, Best Actor in a Supporting Role for Paul Schofield, Best Director, and Best Screenplay. It has been one of my favorite films since I saw it uh, years ago. And let's just get started with what you all thought. What was the good, the bad, and the ugly? And of course, Bryce, if you watch this with your wife, I am curious to hear what she thought of yet another one of my recommendations. Do we add it to the poo pile, so, or did it go okay? So. <laughs> now, I don't know if I don't know if this is like divulged information, but you've you've really you've really kind of cut your rope pretty short with, <laughs> with your recommendations. Yes, um, I was like, hey, we got to watch a movie. And then she's like, "Is this a Cody recommendation?" You should have lied. You should have said it was Brian. <laughs> I I said I was well because you didn't really recommend it. You yeah. just kind of said we need to watch this movie. So I didn't lie. Okay. But then she said, "If this is a Cody recommended movie, I'm not watching it. <laughs> I'm not even kidding." <laughs> no, I believe so you. So that's that's where we start out. And my wife is not a mean-hearted lady or rude, but. Cody's movies, she thinks they suck, and so, I mean, yeah, but when you think something sucks so bad, you kind of get irritated with yes. horrible movies. But, I'll start with what I thought of the movie first, Okay, to leave some suspense out there. <laughs> uh, but I liked it. I thought it was really good. I had to do the thing that I hate the most, but I watched it in sections. Mm. Um mm. I hate doing that because then it's not the full impact of the movie, but I thought it was really good. Um, you talked about your favorite character. Um, mine was uh, Dick Goodwin. I thought that I really liked um, the character and the way he portrayed him. Uh, I thought it was really... He was the reason that I really liked the movie. And, and he's in the whole it. thing, so that's a good character to like. Yeah, yeah. He really, right when he came on, from right when he's reading the the newspaper, I believe, it, when you first see him, is I really like connected to him and stuck with him the whole movie, which he was a really good character for me to follow along. Which, in a way, you kind of do follow him throughout yeah. the movie. I mean, he's kind of a a main character in his own own right, um, but I really liked him a lot, and. I just thought it was a really good overall movie and one in preparing for the show you kind of throw out some threw out some questions um, one that stuck with me was the reality TV show mm-hmm. and like how has that kind of this uh, scandal kind of helped that along which you can see it all over the place I mean with like true TV like that's all it is this is just a bunch of quiz shows it's just you a bunch know. of fake things presented as real. That's all it is. Yeah. And the thing that I think of a lot is where Cody and I used to work, uh, they would get to the other guys would get together for, for lunch and they would watch true TV. Yeah. And one of our coworkers <laughs> um in particular, he I th- really do believe he thought it was a hundred percent true. Oh he did, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think all of them did, but the one for sure believed a hundred percent that everything they were doing all the time was a hundred percent real. There was nothing added. There was no acting involved. Nothing. It was a hundred percent. This is the way it goes. And I, 
I think about that a lot because I think it's just absurd how people can believe this. Like it's so not real yeah. that it is like sickening. Well, you know? I came back from lunch once and I remember he was in awe because they had proven Bigfoot was real. And there was no question left. It was over. The debate yes. was over. They had DNA. You know, yes. that was that was it. And he was totally convinced. And we had lots of discussions. You could not convince him of the more reasonable argument because he'd seen it on TV and they had proven yeah. it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And so in thinking about – I'm watching this TV – in watching this movie and thinking about all that, you can definitely see – how they make millions and billions of dollars from it because just like tv like the quiz show you know like when they when they at the very end of the movie they oh i don't remember the the two producer guys names but they pretty much say like yeah you know this is entertainment you know no one said that we are you know telling that we have to tell the truth it's tv you know we're not and it's so true but everyone believes like you can see in just media media today you know like with like the internet you know facebook all that kind of stuff anything that gets thrown up on the internet or is announced through you know tv or whatever it is everyone believes it well yeah and like, we have everyone's like uh you know the even the president has taken up this fake news idea and texts about yeah. fake news all the time and then the other side says no your news is fake and there's this whole what do you believe and what is this it, the whole thing's kind of run rampant since this yes. time. I mean, yeah, it used to I be mean, back then in the 50s you listened to Walter Cronkite and whatever he said then you're good. That's that's what the news was. Exactly. There wasn't two sides to it. It was just the news and now the showmanship and the entertainment industry has taken over the news and everything else and you don't really know what well, to believe. Yeah, I just thought of something. I don't know what this was on. Maybe I don't remember what I was watching. But maybe this was on the quiz show. I don't remember. But it's talking about how the news, it used to be something, you know, and it used to be like it was presented and the people that you uh, saw announcing the news were like good, upstanding people and they didn't lie to you or ever. But is from this movie, is that even... Who knows? Real? Yeah, you exactly. Know? It, Were they actually... Mm-hmm. Has this just been going on forever and we just keep forgetting it? <laughs> you know, like, and I think this movie, the quiz show, really brings that to, to a light. And the only person that really got the most uh, hurt from it all was Van Doren. Mm-hmm. You know, because he couldn't, he couldn't do, like, really anything after that. And he's the only one that really was the took the brunt of it all Mm -hmm. and you know the rest of them all went off to be either successful or you know not horrible off you know horrible so it's it's very interesting so i liked it i liked it a lot and and uh, (laughs) my wife i she liked it really hey nothing really common ground really did you say it afterwards it was a Cody recommendation and you sprung? No, no, no she'll, she'll never know. Because then she'd hate it automatically. It would change the whole experience. So. It could. It could. She might actually give you credit for one, but then it wasn't really a recommendation, so it doesn't really count. So mm-hmm. <laughs> He only recommended it for the podcast show, but. Yeah. Right. All right. Anyways. Yeah. So, Brian, Brian. So, yeah, your thoughts, Brian. Um, we're still just uh, surface. Is that what you're saying? You can do surface and then, like Bryce did, go into a deeper thought you had. Yeah, just – All right. Well, I, I really love Rob Morrow um, from the Northern Exposure days. I've always liked him and haven't seen everything he's done but uh, really enjoy uh, watching him. Uh, that thick uh, accent uh, was kind of interesting. <laughs> I have seen this before, but I, yes. I just revisit again this past week. And But anyways, his performance was stellar. Um, everyone, there was really just great performances. Yeah. I mean, John Turturro, mm-hmm. for what he did, um, was incredible. Uh, Ray Fiennes, uh, Paul Schofield, you know, this great English actor. It was great to see his... Uh, you could He just had this stature about about him, you know, this 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 presence, this... You know, you could tell that he was esteemed and that he was uh, well-versed, and it was just great to see that. Uh, David Paymer, you know, that played uh, Dan Enright, 
Mm-hmm. Um, he, he did a great job. A lot of, um, you know, uh, facial expressions and things, especially towards the end when, the, you know, the the proverbial crap was hitting the fan. I yeah. mean, there was a lot of, um, you know, texture to his performance, I, I think. And uh, so I, I loved it. Um, I see this kind of um, as like a quasi-redemption story. To me, the main c- character is Charles Van Doren, which probably is to most people but you it's it's interesting when you when you compare the two characters you know you have herbie stemple or uh, john tutorial's character and uh, ray fine's character and they are completely opposite okay because uh tutorial's going for all the the wrong reasons and it you kind of follow you know his kind of process through this and then you see um charles van doren's you know ray fine's character and he goes through this this process of of you know, not wanting to go down this path, but going down it and then feeling horrible for it. And, um, it's, it's almost slightly redemptive. There's a lot of, uh, you know, facial communication at the very last shot. Um, but it's not as satisfying as say, you know, Shawshank Redemption or anything like that. (laughs) So, so it, I, I loved it. Uh, Robert Redford did a great job. This wasn't his debut, right? I mean, he had no, like uh, uh, three ordinary or four people, before. And ordinary People was first, and then the Milagro Beanfield War, and then this, I think. Yeah. So, uh, excellent job. on. Yeah, it was just a well-put-together movie and uh, tightly wound. I liked it. It was good. Yeah, I, I think the thing that really connected with me in the film is that it's kind of a suspense story in a lot of ways. I mean, yeah. obviously yeah. it's a drama, and I like it because it's an investigation. I love, I love detective stories, and it's mm-hmm. kind of that too. But there's no surprise in who did it. I mean, you know who did it, yeah. quote-unquote, from the very, very beginning. And so in a way, it's kind of that Hitchcockian trick of you know who did it, and so the suspense is are they going to get caught? What are they going to choose to do? You know, And there comes a point in the movie that I love about this film is it gets a little deeper than that because you're not just worried for Charles Van Doren getting caught. You know, For me, as you're watching it, and that first time they set him up is they ask him the questions in the interview, and then they tell him, no, it's going to be totally clean when you go in there. Don't worry about it. It won't be like we suggested. And then he gets in there, and the winning question is one he already knows the answer to. And that's going to – you're going to see, is he going to – you know, and they they give him that moment of, are you going to choose this or that in front of millions of people, so that the pressure's on the highest. And there's several moments during the quiz show sections of the film that are very intense. You don't know what somebody's going to do. And later on, John Turturro's character, Herbie Stimple, has been told to take a dive to give the wrong answer, and then you're just yeah, as much yeah, as suspense: yeah. is he going to give the wrong answer, or is he going to stick it to him? And give the right answer. You know, there's a lot of suspense there. Um, also, when uh, the when uh, Charles Van Doren's character, when Ray finds Charles Van Doren, he gives the wrong answer on purpose, gets out, and then they reach in and grab him right back by making him be some kind of guy on the Today Show or something in the morning. You know, he just can't seem to get away. And I love the comparison with uh, Dick Goodwin and Charles Van Doren. Because they're both from these kind of Ivy League backgrounds. And yet, when uh, Dick Goodwin's wife, played by Mira Sorvino, finally spells out, you know, because yeah. Rob Morrow's kind of bending over backwards not to hurt Charles Van Doren. And she spells it out to him and says, look, you are twice the man he is. And why are you, you know, doing this? And I think the audience understands we feel bad for him. We've seen yeah. his whole journey. And so we don't want to destroy him either. And then that also comes to that heartbreaking thing at the end when he gives this really emotional... We're into spoilers, by the way. We yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's from 94. We'll put that on the description. So there, there you, you go. go. Um, when he gives that confession, and then initially everybody's like, what a what a heartfelt confession. And that one guy yeah, takes it to him New York. and says, somebody of your intelligence shouldn't be congratulated for just telling the truth. And again, it's one of those movies that I love because he's totally right. He's absolutely right. Somebody yep, that is yep. as smart as he is and has much should not be congratulated for telling the truth. And yet I feel so bad for Charles Van Doren at the same time. I can hold both, you know, sympathies at the same time. And that's the mark of a great movie to me is when it's not good guy, bad guy. Everybody's a real person. You understand their motivations. You feel for them. And yet there are things you can't get around just like in real life. That's where it reaches a height for me. Yeah. Well, what is interesting I thought about the movie is – 
like you mentioned, you feel bad for him because you kind of followed him the whole time. And you kind of know that Van Doren isn't really in it solely just for money. Um, like the other guy, Stemple, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, he's just kind of in it for the popularity and the money. You can kind of tell. At least that's what the movie kind of portrays to you, which I think is an interesting way. I don't know if this was done on purpose or not, but you kind of see you follow Van Doren and you kind of just get glimpses into the other guy's Mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. You know, he's quizzing his son or he's talking to his wife and you can kind of see that the other guy's life is kind of rocky. You know, it's not like. He's not from an Ivy League school. He's not from a rich family. He's not from a, a popular family or anything mm-hmm. like that, you know. He's kind of just a normal guy who's just trying to make it through life. But he's the bad guy. Like, I never really <laughs> feel super bad for the guy mm-hmm. at all. And they make him look insane. Like, they do such a good job at making him, you know, just be the kooky guy who gets all this trouble started. And... You know, they do a good job. Like, I never really felt bad for him ever. Yeah. I was like, okay, whatever. Well, he's like, like he's in it did. for all the wrong reasons, you know? It's all exactly. for me. Yeah. Which... At least that's what they make you... They portray it out. Yeah. I mean, who knows? Yeah. Maybe he has... Maybe he's trying to get all this money to... Pay off a bookie. His... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. We, we right, exactly. know the type of character he is, and he's not a good guy. He's, like, kind of sleazy, right? Don't you think? Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, I definitely agree. Well, okay, real quick, and then you'll get back to your thought. Real quick. Also, Charles Van Doren, though, talking about liking the popularity, does show when he gets pulled up by the driver, and he waits and acts like he's tying his shoe just so he can get out of the car when there's just so many people to see him. So they both have similar flaws. Yeah, they do. Exactly. And that's kind of my – I guess to bring my whole point because I've been dragging on for a while is that – you are you love Van Doren because you followed him the whole time. Mm. You know you've you've had enough time with him to fall in love with him. You've seen you've met his family, you've everyone. But the other guy, you don't fall in love with him. You yeah. never have time. You only see the bad parts, and so it's easier to dismiss Van Doren's flaws because you know okay he has a great family. That's true. Okay, he's That's a professor. True. He's doing it for other reasons besides just money. And I think that that is a really clever way of of the way they put the movie together in in doing that is making you just like the American people did at that time too. They fell in love with Van Doren because he's this handsome, you know, educator that is making America, you know, love education again. (laughs) And so I don't know where you're going with that. (laughs) No. Not that catchphrase. Um, but I think in when you were talking, I thought that that was kind of an interesting kind of popped in my head. Because just like even um, the investigator guy, he is even doing the exact same thing. And he his likes wife it. is like, no. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah I mean, I'm, I'm sure he's a very likable guy. But just like his wife says, he is your case. Mm-hmm. Like – he is the reason this is even coming about, you know. This is the reason that it's even a issue right now is because he has brought so much light to it. And yeah, I think that that it's a really clever and interesting movie for sure. I think I I kind of have this theory and I'm just kind of shooting from the hip. I apologize, but I I literally just finished it uh earlier today. I had to watch it in two parts as well, not the most ideal situation. But I think that uh, the main character is is Rafe Fiennes, Charles Van Van Dorn. I like what you said, Bryce, that we follow him kind of from the beginning to the end. I think that Robert Redford wants us to put ourselves in the shoes of Rob Morrow. I think he is the audience, okay? He's the one Mm -hmm. that that is trying to uh, get justice, trying to find out the truth, trying to, um, you know make things right and and it's not an easy process for him he he falls in love with the the charm of charles van doren and the the nice guy that he is and you can see his conflict from throughout the whole thing with you know mira sovino's character um even to the very end like i mentioned before those final exchanges well before that in the courtroom 
when mm-hmm. when he's reading that you know it focuses on Rob Morrow's character uh, several times and you can tell yeah. that he is broken that that um you know nothing's going to come from this he's he's seeing the whole world fall apart that he has uh, created to rectify this right. problem bring down the television company these big corporations and it's not going to happen and there's there's fallout you know there's uh, fall boys or uh, what do you call them whipping boys or yeah whipping help boys, me yeah. out yeah whipping boys uh, scapegoats scapegoats <laughs> yes ray yeah. fine's character is a scapegoat and rob morrow can see that he can relate to him he can appreciate him he can see that he did wrong but he wants to forgive him and that comes to fruition at the very end when you see those closing shots with um you know the communication between them they don't talk at all but it's all in the face you know there's there is a redemption that takes place there is it uh fully you know shown out no it's not but it you know i think we're rob morrow and uh i I think that's what it's about yeah 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 i totally agree well my favorite relationship in the film is between uh Mark Van Doren and Charles Van Doren, father and son, yeah. Paul Schofield yes. and Ray Fiennes. There's this real camaraderie. You can tell the dad is so proud of his son who's following in his footsteps. And, you know, and there's this interesting idea early on that uh, Charles Van Doren wrote a novel about a patricide, which is a boy who kills his father. And they put that idea in yeah, there yeah. early on. And that's basically... You know, morally and emotionally, what kind of happens throughout the movie is Charlie is this, like, again, everybody loves him. He's charming, he's handsome, and the dad can't help but be proud of him. And then to find out that he's supposed to be an academic, he's going to be teaching at Columbia, he already is, and he's going to be a full professor, and he cheated on a TV show? I mean, it's the most trivial. You know, he confers, he says it's like plagiarizing a comic book, is how the dad puts it. You know, it's. It's ridiculous. And the when he finally has the guts to tell his dad in this discussion, it's my favorite scene in the film. And his family does this thing that only, I'm sure, like New England intellectual families do, which is where they throw Shakespeare quotes at each other and that try to great. figure out what they are. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's not my family. Like, that's. <laughs> that would, that do would you guys do happen. film quotes, though? <laughs> uh, sometimes, yeah, but they're usually not Shakespeare. Anyway, um, but they're doing that, and he starts to do that. Uh, Charlie does in the, you know, in the discussion, and the dad's not having any of it. They said, "This is not a game." And at the end, the last line is, "He says your name is mine, and you've kind of drug me yes. through this." And the way that Paul Schofield delivers that whole that line and that whole scene, it kills me every time I watch it. Is mm-hmm. and then at the end, when they're bringing him out of the the hearing yes and yes. he says now it's just time for charlie to get back to his teaching and one of the reporters says we just received word he's been fired by columbia and there's no words but you can see the dad yes. the last little bit of him crumbling and falling away at that moment Yeah, i think that that it's so interesting because he talks about they come out and he's like i've always been been mm-hmm. proud of my son you know and then they're like oh yeah he's been fired and the mom looks like she's just gonna like die yeah. right there mm-hmm. and it's just nothing like he's like okay you've done it you've you finally completed putting the axe in my back and ruining the whole entire family yeah you know and yet i tell. don't catch any bitterness from the that's parents. what i was going to bring up yeah. no, you, no you yeah, guys are no. talking bad about him but i saw like this fatherly uh figure in them or you know like a sense of a shame, but then of they were there. You know, he asked them to mm-hmm. come. He was still a father. He came to the courtroom and sat oh. by his wife's side. And yeah, I think that that in a way he was he was very disappointed. It brought shame to the family, but he was proud that he was rectifying. And he had to live with those demons the rest of his I life. I agree with that. And but there I are glimpses that. of that fatherly bond. And uh, he was a good father. Yeah, uh, Mark Van Doren. I, I well, and I catch more anguish that his yeah, watching his yes. son go through this horrible thing uh-huh. more than he's worried about the family. I mean, again, the dad is a whole person in the film. He's angry about it at first, which is a natural reaction, and he has all these different emotions. But the overriding one that I get from the actor's performance is, "You've ruined your own life, and I can hardly stand to watch it." The same thing from the mom. You know, it's that's just exactly awful. what I was thinking. That's exactly what I was thinking. Like when he's reading his statement 
and it shows the back of his head i was thinking uh like it must be horrible for them to watch their kid have to go through this mm-hmm. and not be able to do anything about it you know that has to be mm-hmm. and then and like i said he you can he brings you know shame the family name whatever but also you can tell that he's just like sick yes you know it's a good word it's like he is just he has no words because he he's speechless you know like that's all he really wanted for his son was his teaching career Mm -hmm. and he's he's ruined it i mean to put it any other way he's he's ruined it and you go to find out that he never does teach again Mm -hmm. like in real life he never does teach again and you know as a parent you have like dreams for your children and i know if if i had a dream for for my little girl to see her be able to like okay she's achieved it and then it gets torn away from her Mm -hmm. like that would be heartbreaking for me you know even if she did get herself into a big mess it'd still be heartbreaking Mm -hmm. because you know this is a dream for them and now they don't have it because of a you know they plagiarized the comic book and and it's just you know. something so trivial too for him you know yeah that's the thing that really is heartbreaking about it um mm-hmm. if anybody else has it any is. more comments about the film i wanted to go into more of the true life story behind it for a little bit and maybe some yeah, of the definitely. ethical questions we were going to talk about um some things i found out in my research before we did this is um the movie is fairly accurate uh but it does do a lot of condensing um the when herbie stemple and Charles Van Doren go up against each other. They actually tied three times before uh, he won, and all three matches were arranged. Huh. So there was no that whole scene where he's like he makes him decide in front of all that didn't happen. Was it's that a just very, for editing purposes, or well, and it's a very good storytelling device too. It makes that scene so much more tense. Of he has to make that decision right there. So it's a great addition by the writer. But did not happen. Um, another thing is he never told his dad directly that he had done it. They uh, they had some some innuendo conversations about, you know, I'm kind of in trouble here. And he says, I know. Well, do your best. And that's all they ever talked about. It. They never had an really? out-and-out discussion about it. So that's it. fabricated. That's interesting. A lot of this is, comes from a 2008 article that uh, Charles Van Doren actually finally spoke about everything. That uh, put out there about the film and about what really happened. And he said that his dad and his family stuck by him. And he started working for the Encyclopedia Britannica after that and made a career yes, out of yeah. it. And he wrote several books, one of which I happen to notice my wife owns. Just totally oh, unrelated. Nice. I was like, is that the same? Is that Charles Van? And I looked it up. I was like, holy crap. He what wrote was that the name book? of it? Do you remember? It's called uh, How to Read a Book is what it was called. And she got it for a college class. And we had it on our shelf, and I was like, that's crazy. <laughs> so, that is. yeah, interesting stuff. I tried to read it, and it was over my head. But um, <laughs> So the uh, that was interesting. If you can go also on YouTube and watch, they have the actual episodes of 21 <laughs> on there. And the thing that was I thought was interesting is Herbie Stimple is not nearly as like nerdy and neurotic as they portray him. And Charles Van Doren is not nearly as smooth. And charming as they portray him, they kind of pushed those elements in the film to help you draw comparisons between the two. Because an audience back then would have known a lot of them, the Van Doren family. It was a very prominent family, and they would have thought he was very cool and charming just from being part of that family. A modern audience doesn't know the family anymore, so they had to do that through performance. But, uh, yeah, it's very interesting. And also, the real Herbie Stemple is in the film. He's one of the, the guys that Rob Murrow tries to ask questions about the case just for a oh. second he just kind of shakes his head and doesn't answer i don't know if you remember that guy but that's the actual yeah. herbie stemple um charles van doren said he saw the film he said he understood he had to condense things for time and stuff and he didn't actually hate it he said he said he thought it was pretty good he just he didn't like the fact that they said he never taught again at the end he said he did teach in some small places and that hmm. that was something that stuck in his craw and um, Ray Fine. So that's a false on on my end. I actually did say that. <laughs> yeah. So you know, you, you, mistake, mistake. It's yeah. okay. It's I didn't a, do as much research. But the the movie yeah. says that he never taught again. You know, it says it at the end. Yeah, yeah it does. But uh, also, Ray Fines. They they actually offered Charles Van Doren a bunch of money to be a consultant on the film, 
and uh, he told he turned him down at the time. He told Robert Redford no that he wasn't going to do it. And uh, this is the first time he'd spoken about it was 2008. Ray Fiennes wanted to meet him, but he wasn't going to work with the movie, so he got lost air quotes yeah. up there. Went up to the porch and actually got to meet Charles Van Doren and asked directions from him. And Charles Van Doren remembers the guy who came up and did that. And then he said he watched the movie and he's like, hey, <laughs> that's the guy who got lost up here. So he knew it was up. And Ray Fine said the only impression he got from him was that he was sad, which also kind of offended the real Charles Van Doren. And yet, I think the things that offend us are probably true. So I don't know yeah. how, you know. Yeah. yeah. So uh, as far as like real life stuff, I think that was all I had to talk about. I did want to mention one thing that the question I had, and I'll put it to you all to kind of wrap up the discussion here. To compare the 50s world, we talked a little about this, the 50s world with today's world. If this quote unquote scandal happened today, would it be a blip on the radar? Would it be a big deal? Would anybody be surprised anymore? I don't know. What okay, are your so so to add to your question, say it happened yes. on Jeopardy. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, like uh, Ken Jenkins or whatever yeah. the the one. Like, say I, we found out he cheated. I think it would de- it depend on the show. Like with Jeopardy, I would be kind of irritated. For like, I'd be like, really? They're that's kind of stupid, you know? Because I can kind of understand. Like, if you think about the quiz show, and kind of like we mentioned earlier in the the show it's kind of just repeating you know yeah. with the tv thing so i don't think the people in the 50s are really any different except we get lots more information lots quicker than they did so i don't know if that's a positive or a negative to us but i think that yeah we would determining what show it actually is we would be pretty i think up in arms about it like if they i think if people found out that jeopardy or any game show like that was rigged i think people would be kind of irritated by it yeah it would be a scandal i think can you think about this though put it this way can you imagine any show where this happened that they would have congressional hearings on the matter after ah yeah i I don't think so i mean congressional hearings i i kind of think don't you think the reason that that happened is because it's a big new media yeah exactly i really do yeah and Mm -hmm. so you know tv is like the whoa you know it's crazy and another thing that i really like kind of about the whole big it's a big tv is when uh, he's trying to talk to the president of nbc and he's like dude i'm the president of nbc (laughs) yeah (laughs) you know like get out of my way Ah, that's so I really like. And it that. turns out he's right because yeah. the yeah. president and then when he's is untouchable. Like, yeah. He has connections. The, I think the best singer in the whole movie is like I've got. He's like says whatever. I don't remember the exact quote, but he's like I got you on the ropes or something like that. And he's like, so then why are you sweating? Yes. Yeah. And then the elevator just <laughs> you're like, oh. I mean, what? Are you, I was I was hoping like Rob would just say because I know I'm going to get you, but you know. <laughs> That I mean, you can't say anything. I know that, well, that was a good comeback. Dick Goodwin oh. is is this is his if in the movie at least it's his first big case. You know, yeah. he's kind of yes. wet behind the ears, and I even love the scene when he's trying to prep Herbie Stimple on what his answers are going to be, and he all of a sudden realizes that his star witness comes across as absolutely crazy, and he grabs his stomach and runs to the bathroom, and I was like, wow, it's so yeah. real. And that's exactly <laughs> what you'd be doing right then yeah. if that was you. You know, there's some real reality to the performance yeah definitely yeah you could sense very good you could sense the facing the giants you know like um yeah it was david and goliath you know what i mean you could you could i think he played that really well and yeah bryce yeah that scene was awesome that was good like even when you can tell he he knows that he's got a huge case and that this could make his career Mm -hmm. and then He's questioning the Stemple guy, and he's just making a joke of it all. Mm-hmm. And you can just tell he's like, oh, my gosh, this is the biggest mistake. <laughs> like, this guy is making a joke of all of this, and, <laughs> like, this is serious for me. You can, he did such a good job at portraying the character. 
superb job. Well, and I, I love really also like a lot of his investigative stuff. One of my favorite scenes in the film is when he's watching, I think they call it Kinescope. He's watching old films of the show, and he catches somebody give a right answer when they were supposed to give a wrong answer. And the host, you know, says, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, wait, did you say this? Oh, yeah, that is right. And he plays it back. And all that little investigative detail, um, you have to have an interesting face and be able to do stuff non-verbally to pull that stuff off. And it was a great choice for, for Rob Morrow because you can just watch him all day. Like you said, in, that, in the ending, him and Ray Fiennes have a really emotional scene with no dialogue. And yeah. they're really far yeah. apart. They're like across this big distance. And yet it's kind of an emotional gut punch at the end that they both do without speaking. And of course, Ray Fiennes, I think it goes without saying, is one of the finest actors yeah. you know, of our generation. From the year before this, he did Schindler's List and he played the mm-hmm. the sadistic Nazi commandant that shot people for fun. And then just a couple of years ago, I think it was 2015, he was in Grand Budapest Hotel. And who knew he yes, was hilarious. So you know, he could so be good. an incredible comedian. So, you know, right at the beginning of his career, a lot of promise there. I was sorry watching this. It reminded me that Rob Murrow hadn't done a lot that I had seen after this. And I was sad about that because he's a great talent too. But what a lineup. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess I just wanted to ask, in the preparation, you asked some questions. And just one other that I really liked was, what would you have done if you were in the contestant's shoes? Mm. I think that's a really interesting question because, you know, the part of you wants to say, you know, I would I would tell him no, you know, <laughs> to go stick it. But would you really, like, honestly, if you really, I mean, it's just money in your pocket, you know, really. They're pretty much just saying, hey, come on this TV show and we'll pay you. So, like, honestly, you can see how they got roped into it. Well, and there's I that mean, whole just... seduction scene with Dan Enright and the other producer working on Charles Van Doren. You know, offering yeah. all these logical explanations and no, everybody, yeah, this and that. And it's it's, it is, it's a seduction scene is really oh, what yeah. it is. So, I mean, honestly, I think if, if I was in the contestant's shoes, I would probably go along with it, you know? And, I mean... I, I think that I would. Well, I and can I, I say this? Rob do Morrow, again, is such a good actor. He makes me believe his character would not have. I totally buy that. When they have that discussion. Yeah, I, I agree. And he says, I all agree. this happened and, you know, throwing it all in. Throw the money in. Throw the fame. Would you do it? And he goes, no, of course not. And I totally believe that Dick Goodwin, as the character in the film, would never touch it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So, I don't know. I think that... I mean, if they really... I think I would do it. <laughs> Just straight up. It, it, is, it is a temptation. I'll put it that way. You've got fame, fortune, all that. And it started with... Here's another interesting thing. It started with just one, you know? Like, we just want yeah. you to dethrone this guy. And pretty soon, it was like a regular thing. And, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's a tough one. I'm going to uh, plead the fifth on that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so my friends don't think I'm any more of a loser than I am, but uh, it would be tough. Well, I mean, in, in all reality, it would be your... tough. And I think anyone on their moral, moral high horse would be like, no, I would never do that. Yeah. But, I mean, come on. Really, if it's proposed to you and you can win half a million dollars in one show, well, like, forget, like, oh, people know you. Like, forget all that. That's a lot well, of... And- especially in today's mindset or not mindset but Mm. in today's society with the reality televisions that we have now like in a heartbeat like people would do it in a heartbeat you know just because everyone knows it's fake and so they'd probably just uh, you know it would be easy to rationalize and to justify your actions because well it's just a television show you know I'm not harming anyone really you know I'm an actor. Yeah. You know, it'd be easy to justify. I do think I do think after a while it'd probably suck. Like really. Yeah, bad. he pro yeah. Because he wanted out. You know, it'd be probably it'd probably get kind of miserable, uh-huh. you know, having to portray this certain thing at the T V show. But right in the moment, 
you can't tell me that someone well, is going to be Well, that's like, the whole tragedy you know of the, the real story and the movie is a guy yeah. who didn't need it. He did not yeah. need the yes. money. He did not really need the fame. He's already a part of a famous family. And it's kind of an enigma. It's not really answered. Why in the world would that guy do it? Of all people. Exactly. You know, Herbie Stimple you get. I get Herbie Stimple. I mean, yeah. in some oh, yeah. some ways that's uncomfortable, I am Herbie Stimple. You know, like, <laughs> it's, it's the, you you're know, one. You're I mean, for, one missing tooth loud. away from him. <laughs> I mean, for crying out loud, if we can be totally honest with ourselves for a moment, we are all guys yeah. who don't make a ton of money, who don't mind if people know who we are because we do a podcast in our spare time. Right, exactly. So, you know, That's what I'm saying. We are more Herbie Stemple than right. I think we would like to admit. We are much less Charles Van Dorn, and that's the mystery of the film. It's no mystery why Herbie does it. It's yeah. a giant mystery yeah. why Charlie does it. Mm-hmm. Which I think you can kind of see that in some of the scandals that happen today. You know, you don't ever hear, like, the big... The big news story, big scandal, isn't about some person on the street, you know. You know, those never make the national news, you know, mm. the gossip channels. It's always about the the people who are already somewhat prominent already who get the big tabloids. And that is what's interesting. And so I think that just like in the movie portrays you know this is their like golden god Mm -hmm. you know he is already pretty you know prominent people know who he is let's hook this guy up he already wants to be on the quiz show yes you know Mm -hmm. like he they've already got him hooked now they just gotta reel him in and it's pretty again the the movie doesn't answer it and like you said real life doesn't answer it why he does it who knows i mean they kind of throw in like oh maybe you kind of need some money but then it's kind of like well does he really you know so yeah i think that i think that the people who make those make tv shows the producers all those guys just like dan enright they're in it for a reason yeah and they get people there for a reason i mean look at all the tv shows nowadays I mean, have you ever seen um, Lizard Lick Towing? Yes. Like, you can't, so fake. You can't tell so me. So fake. You can't tell me. Yeah. What was the title you guys, said? I didn't hear. Lizard Lick Towing. It's absolutely, it's hilarious. Like, it's hilarious to watch. But you can't tell me that those guys are, like, just out of Hollywood actors. You know, some producer dudes were like, hey, let's film your life and we'll throw in some extra things that we want to throw in there you know and you can't tell me that those guys are like oh no we can't do it because <laughs> you know are you kidding me it's probably some guy who had a towing shop who got a big break and i think if someone knocked on my door right now and said i will pay you money to record you in your podcast life or whatever sounds stupid probably wouldn't watch it <laughs> i would do it i would do it i would do it like why not? I would have I would have reservations though. Like maybe the podcast thing, but I, if somebody was like, "All right, you can have a reality show, and we're gonna follow you around all day, and we'll film stuff, and then you know they're gonna edit it out of sequence, and you'll look like a monster." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even no matter how much money they pay me, I have to think about my little girl. I have to think about my wife. I have to think about it's true. My but I'm future, telling you, you, know. you don't have this time to think about this stuff. <laughs> this dude just writes you a check. For two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and says, "Sign this contract," just like they did on the TV show. Well, and with guy. the in the you quiz show saying? story, it was a respectable show per se. Yes. Yeah, you know, it wasn't. It yeah. was not lizard lick towing. It was Jeopardy. You know, and exactly. so you know, being on Jeopardy, so even okay, up the ante, up the ante even more. That's you true. I think saying? we are mixing our metaphors a little bit, or at least I am. Okay, because. From the mindset of reality television, I would do it because, like, I'm, well, I'm just a character. That's what they are. They're characters. If if anyone thinks that that's how they're like Mm -hmm. in their real life, they're they're dumb. And but when you put your mind in like Jeopardy, that that is different. I I don't think I could do Jeopardy like an established (laughs) like game show. I don't think I could do that. So, like, on a reality show, edit me however you want. I don't care. But Jeopardy, no. So, 
Wow, that's yeah, that's, fascinating. My, that's that's my stance. I'm the polar opposite. Like I would probably yeah, do I Jeopardy, totally agree with that. but I would be, yeah. be really hard pressed to do a reality show. I'm not a character. I'm. I just don't. I don't know. I don't like that. I don't. One. I don't think people would like to watch my life. It's pretty. <laughs> I don't think so either at yeah. all. But but I'm just saying. Like I don't think you know, I could do it yeah. on Jeopardy. But. If they wanted to edit me, however, make me out to look, I, I'd just say, hey, that's not me. Well, My and you bring up an interesting me. point because it's not just being on Jeopardy. It's being on Jeopardy and having to know the answers and pretend like you don't know the answers. Yeah. And have all that Yeah, pressure. that's true. That's tough. You know what's interesting? I think we need to look into the dude that won it a billion times. <laughs> Ken, because how Ken interesting Jenkins, would that be? Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying the guy's not smart and the guy doesn't know the questions. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying we need uh, Dick Goodwin <laughs> to maybe <laughs> ruffle some papers, take a look. I mean, I think it would be really interesting. This is a little side note, but have you guys ever seen the, the Ken Jenkins, um, the whole moment on Ken, Ken Jenkins? That question, have you heard that? Yeah, that's so hilarious. If you so haven't hilarious. seen it, do yourself a favor and look it up. Cody, have you seen it? No, I haven't. Uh-uh. So I'll read you, you the I'll up. read you the question. The the question. Uh, let's see if I can can find it. I searched for it really quick, and of course, it's not right where I need it. So, anyways, the the question was something to the effect. Oh, I'm not going. I'm not smart enough to try to do that from the fly. <laughs> 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 There's no way. I don't remember it. It, it was something about um, oh. Can you find it, Bryce? I'm trying to. <laughs> Stall. Stall. <laughs> Cody, talk. We'll find it. Talk. What? I don't, I'm just curious as to what this question could possibly be when it's called the ho moment. I have no idea what is uh, well, coming there's a my thousand, way. There's a thousand and videos I actually on have, there. This is going to sound uh, uninformed, but I have no idea who Ken Jenkins is. It's so, Jennings. I was, I was wrong. <laughs> Yeah, it's Jennings. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, Ken Jennings. I, I figure out from context clues that he won Jeopardy a lot, but that's all I know. Well, okay, I'll give you a quick another quick fact about the real story of Quiz Show while you're looking that up. Um, he lost, Charles Van Doren lost to Vivian Nearing, right? And that's in the film. He loses to her, and he chooses to get out because he just can't take it anymore. Not true. It was scripted that he would lose. His time was over, and they wanted to bring her in. And so that whole outroar, uh, outcry about, we've got to get him back on the show, give him a bonus round, whatever, none of that happened. It was scripted that he would lose. And actually, Vivian Nearing also faced charges uh, afterwards for perjury and things like that. So another slight inaccuracy. But again, I think it's perfect writing for the character because you have to show he wants to get out yeah. and can't quite get out. So I liked, I liked the change. I know it's blasphemous to like things that are changed from real life but i do all the time because movies have to work that way <laughs> so yeah well i i found it because i was using a uh, bing which was an accident and i should have been using google google i google. i hope we never have <laughs> we just lost bing as a sponsor for the rest of our that's podcast. true we did bing uh, maybe sucks. We got google <laughs> all right so here it is the question this was a final jeopardy question i think i don't know I just seen the the video, but it says this term for a long handled gardening tool can also mean an immoral pleasure seeker. The answer is ho. I don't understand what the problem. That's is. what That's Ken Jennings <laughs> thought it was. The answer is a rake. Oh yeah, that could be it too. <laughs> yeah, that could be it too. Yeah. And that was the actual answer, and uh, it was funny. Alex Trebek got a chuckle out of that, and so did <laughs> the rest of the world. We're still laughing at it, but anyways, it was funny. Well, I guess to wrap up, this has been an interesting conversation. Uh, so let us know. Would you go on to the to the game show and lie and dis dis? Uh, I don't know the word. Deceive. I don't know. I'm trying to be all smart. <laughs> Deceive. I don't know. That that totally <laughs> failed. But uh, let us know what you would do in in that moral question, because uh, I think that would be that's really interesting to to find out. You know how I feel about it. Uh, <laughs> so let us know. 
in in the comments. Uh, this has been the Valhalla Filmcast. I am Bryce Thompson. I'm Brian Hammond. And I'm Cody Ryrie. And we'll talk to you next time. The following viewers' opinions and commentary are the sole property of the Valhalla Filmcast. Any unauthorized reproduction without prior consent is prohibited. Any incidental music, audio clips, or film trailers are used for the sole purpose of film criticism and commentary as allowed under the Fair Use Act.